Good morning. morning. It's good to see you here. Hope you're doing well. We're going to continue on in our series called At the Core. Today we're going to be talking about compassion. Everyone say compassion. Compassion. We've been looking uh, over the last several weeks at these core values, and these are really the 10 core values that help direct us as a church body and help keep us on track towards the vision. It's not the vision, understand. It's the core values that keep us on track and moving towards the vision that God has given us. Several weeks ago in our very first message on at the core, we talked about unity and the importance of unity. In John chapter 17, Jesus, and one of the few things that he prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he was about to be crucified, Jesus prayed that we, right here today, right now, that we would be one with the Father and with one another. Unity is important, and you know, that's one of the things that the enemy constantly tries to pick at in Christians is the unity part, because he knows that if people can put their heads together and their hearts together, that nothing is impossible, and we can see our world and our community transformed when we're unified and together. The second week, we looked at the core value of excellence, and excellence is doing the best that we can with what we have, and you know what? If it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. And that we should do all the things that we do with all of our hearts as working for the Lord. In the third week, we looked at the core value of humility. And uh, many of you remember Pastor Angie sharing that a little bit. And, and uh, that it's important for us to be humble. Then we looked at the core value of serving. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Last week, we looked at the core value of faith. And going to the mountains, do you remember this? Rather than speaking and going to God and telling God all the time how big the mountain is, going to God and saying, God... Uh, and rather going to the mountain and telling the mountain how big God is. That's faith, and uh, I just want to say it's really cool to hear some of your stories this past week and just how the faith is building you, and uh, so I encourage you to continue to let me know some of the cool things that are happening. But today we're going to continue on, and we're going to be talking about compassion. If you have your Bible, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Bring your Bible with you if you can. I know we uh, provide it for you on the screen, but there's just something good about opening your Bible and reading along. And uh, so bring your Bible with you. And uh, anyway, Ephesians 4 verse 32. Let's look at this together. Like I said, it's going to be on the screen. When, When we talk about compassion, we use different kind of words. We, you know, sometimes equate compassion with words like pity or empathy, or feeling sorry for someone, or having sympathy for someone. But compassion is far more than that. And in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Paul speaking to the church of Ephesus, and the believers believers there, he said this. He said, be kind and what? Y'all are going to have to do a whole lot better than that. Let's try that again. Be kind and... Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Let me read it again. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Isn't it interesting that there's a distinction drawn here between being kind and compassionate? See, compassion is different from sympathy and empathy and feeling sorry for someone. And, and I love the Greek word for compassion. And, and many times, you know, I'll share with you different terms and different Greek terms. And, and, and the reason is, is because the New Testament was written in Greek. And so there are words that uh, when, when these scriptures were written in the Greek, they translated into English. But sometimes the English vernacular just doesn't capture what was really being said in that moment. You know, we... You know, they, they may have had 10 ways of explaining something and uh, 10 different words for it, and we've got like this one word, compassion. And so this word compassion in the Greek is the Greek word splagnos. I know it kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? Splagnos is the Greek word. Now, let me tell you what that means, the definition in the Greek for the word compassion. Are you ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? Here's what it means. It means to have strong bowels. Some of you are saying, if only. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) To have strong bowels. You're like, how does having strong bowels have anything to do with being compassionate? See, in ancient times, when the Bible was written during this time, it meant when they were saying have strong bowels, that the bowels, the internal organs, it was associated with the seat of the emotions. It was, you know, you know here, here's a good way that we talk about it today. I've just got this gut feeling. Have you ever heard that before? You know, something happens and you just 
feel it internally. You just kind of sense, you know, maybe you see somebody or there's a situation or something going on. And just internally, you just kind of feel the stir. You just kind of feel internally like, oh, man, there, there's something going on there. And that's, you know, we call it a gut feeling. But for them, they would use the term, I've got strong bowels. I'm feeling strongly about a particular thing, which is interesting because when I think, you know, this is kind of crazy, but in preparation and study and doing some research for some of this, you know, I heard the word strong bowels for the definition and, you know, in my humanity, my mind automatically went to IBS. (laughs) Do you know what IBS is? Irritable bowel syndrome. Some of you have heard that term before, and you know, you're thinking, what does that have to do? Well, spiritually, there are times, I can really make an analogy here, listen, spiritually, there are times that we have ICS, rather than having strong bowels and having that uh, strong gut feeling for people, rather than having that, we have irritable compassion syndrome, ICS. Do some people, you know, you know what I'm talking about, there are certain people at times that you just get around and they just irritate you. They just bother you just to be around them. They just bother you. You, you, don't, you, know, you don't want to hear them talk. You don't want to listen to them. You know, just hearing their voice at times, it's just annoying. You get really, really irritated. And, and that's what I'm talking about here because compassion is looking at it. It's having that strong, that gut feeling that this is somebody who I really, really want to help. I don't want to be irritated with them. I want to be kind and compassionate. One theologian says that compassion is actually the ethical and the moral paradigm in our spiritual lives living for Christ. That it is that important for us to have compassion. And I want to share with you really three characteristics of compassion that separate compassion from feeling sorry for someone or having sympathy for someone. And so I want to encourage you, write these things down because they will. If you'll apply these things to your life, I say it every week, it really will bring transformation to you as a Christ follower. And this area of compassion is paramount because it's one of the things that Jesus exhibited more than anything else. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, and here's the first thing I want to share with you, and that is that compassion sees. Compassion sees. Look with me in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It says this, It says, when he saw the crowds, referring to Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And it goes on to say that Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers or the laborers are few. Pray then and ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest field. This is one of the few places that we have in the Bible where we actually see that Jesus has a problem. Did you know that Jesus has a problem? In this particular passage, the problem Jesus has, he says, there's just not enough laborers. There are not enough people. Pray that God would send people, pray that God would send laborers. And as we pray for laborers, we gotta start, in order to be a soul winner, you guys with me this morning? You're awfully quiet, I need some amens every now and then. In order for us to be soul winners, we have to care about the people that we're trying to reach. We've got to care. You can't soul win. You can't reach somebody for Christ if you don't care about them and love them. And I'm just wondering if maybe, can I get all in your face today? Listen, I'm just wondering if maybe that's why we don't see the transformation and the community and the national and the worldwide transformation that is possible through Christ is because sometimes we just don't care. I was in a church one time in our small groups. We call them community groups here. But our small groups there, we called them care groups. And I remember joking around, you know, one time and saying, you know, I think the biggest group that we have in the church is the I don't care group. Seems to be the largest ones. You know, everybody attends that one and everybody can attend that one. Do you know why? Because you never have to show up because you just don't care. When do you guys meet? Well, we really don't. We don't care. (laughs) What's your Bible study on? Don't know. Don't care. How's your attendance? It's great. How many do you have? Don't care. You don't ever have to do anything. The I don't care groups. But that's not compassion. If we're going to reach people with the gospel message, we have to have compassion. And compassion sees. The Bible says that when Jesus, what? He saw the crowds. Jesus looked and he saw the people. And can you just catch an image of this? Can you just see this? And and there's another passage in John chapter 6 that I just thought about. 
where Jesus actually sees the people and, and Jesus is communicating. And I see the compassion of Jesus preaching to the people and it says that some of them, they heard the words that he was saying and some of the words that he was sharing and, and they just said, this is way too difficult, this is way too hard and they turned around and left. And in that moment, I'm sure that Jesus was aching deep down in his soul for their salvation and in this passage here, we see Jesus looking over this group of people and it says that when he saw the crowds... He had compassion on them. Compassion sees. You know, it's hard to see the needs around us when we're so worried about the things that are going on in our own lives. And I know we've all done this before. I'm guilty of it. I know you're guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. But there are moments that we are so focused on our own problems and the things that we're dealing with and the things that we're going through in our lives that it's hard for us to see the things that are happening around us. And I can tell you that if you'll begin to just open your eyes and you'll begin to look around, you're going to find people that are in way worse of a situation than you are. And it helps to give you a better perspective when you can see the world or see those around you through a different set of of lenses. Jesus looked through the lenses. He looked through the eyes of compassion. Let me ask you this question. When you look at people, do you look at them with the eyes of a doctor or do you look at them with the eyes of a judge? See, we look at people sometimes and we see people and we quickly judge them. You know, we judge them based on ethnicity. We judge them based on socioeconomic status. We judge them sometimes on where they came from or who they hang out with. And we're very, very quick. You know, we get like an A plus a lot of times for judging. We're really, really good. We're quick. And sometimes we call judging discernment. But we're really good at the judgment part at times, or at least I am. It's like, you know, real quick, you try to size somebody up and you see them and, you know, try to make all these determinations. And it's so easy to sometimes look at those situations. And when we do that and we see people like that, it prevents us from being able to see the need that is really going on in their lives and looking at them rather than through the eyes of a judge, looking at them through the eyes of a doctor saying, here is somebody who is really really going through it. I've used this statement for a long time, hurting people hurt people. And some of the people that annoy you the most, some of the people that bug you the most, some of the people that irritate you the most, often are some of the people who are the most broken on the inside. They're the ones that are struggling. They're the ones that are having a hard time. Hurting people hurt people. But compassion sees when Jesus saw the crowds he had compassion on them now now during this time in this particular passage you guys still with me amen Amen. when Jesus shared this the people that were around him there was so little compassion and that's why there were thousands of people that were drawn to Jesus if you look throughout the word man throughout the new testament you'll see that there were crowds and crowds and crowds thousands hundreds thousands of people that would follow Jesus and I'm convinced that the reason that they followed Jesus is because there was something different about his life there was something that when they interacted with him when they came into contact with him they sensed the compassion that oozed out of his soul out of who he was and so as a result they were living in a time they were living in a system that showed very very little compassion for anyone there was little compassion for the weak there was little compassion for the lost or the blind or the handicapped or the chronic ill and the reason there was so little compassion is because they actually believed that the reason they were in the condition that they were was because it was a punishment they were suffering as a punishment for the sin that they had committed or that their parents had committed and so as a result if there was any kind of ailment if there was any kind of issue anything wrong with you whatsoever you would be alienated and kind of cast out and have no compassion I'm glad that's not happening today because none of us would have compassion extended to us because we all have issues we all have things going on in our lives and so Jesus stepped into that type of a scene He stepped into that kind of a culture where there was so little compassion, where everybody fell into a category. Even the tax collectors, here they were, they were Jews, but yet they were on the wrong side politically. And one of the first people, get this, this just blows my mind, here one of the first people that Jesus calls is a tax collector. One of the most hated people. They were Jewish 
But yet they were representing Rome and they were collecting taxes for Rome. And there was a big divide between the Jewish people and Rome. So when you had these in-between people that were the tax collectors that were collecting taxes on behalf of Rome, Rome had actually given them authority and the approval to increase the taxes a little bit so that they could line their pockets. And so the Jews saw the tax collectors as the Romans. They hated them. They hated them because of the things that they did. And what does Jesus do? Jesus steps on the scene. And the very first gospel that we have, the gospel of Matthew, he's a tax collector. The word that we have, he's a tax collector. He is one of the people that got no compassion. Yet Jesus, what does Jesus do? Jesus goes over to his house. Jesus has dinner with him. And the Pharisees accused Jesus of being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors. I'm just wondering if recently you've been accused of being a friend of tax collectors. Why? Jesus had compassion. Jesus saw the crowd in a different way. And during that time, it just seemed like everybody was marginalized. Everybody was put into a different category. And really, it's not much different today. You know, we like to think that, I'm just going to say it. We like to think that we've got it all together. And we've got it figured out. And, and there's nothing really, as Christians, there's nothing wrong internally within us. But depending on how we grew up, things that have happened in our lives, deep down inside, there's probably some prejudice in all of us that separate us and cause us to put people in categories. It may even cause us to look at people or certain groups of people as being unreachable well these people can't be reached because they're this way these people can't be reached because they're this way well these people are in the condition they are because of the decisions that they've made and the things that they've done and very quickly we can get into an attitude of different people groups that can't be reached all around us we may even say to ourselves well you know we live in a community and it's really hard to reach people in our community because everybody has stuff and you know we got all these gated communities and different things like that and it's really hard to reach people and i would say to you listen that there are people all around us thousands upon thousands of people in our community they may drive nice cars and they may live in nice homes but they pull into their gated communities and they lift their garage doors up and they pull their cars in they get out and shut the garage doors and they go into their house and inside when they walk in those doors there is hurt all inside of them i talked with somebody last night uh, without getting into the details in the field that he's in he works in naples with billionaires and millionaires sees them on a regular basis and, 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 and interacts with them and talks to them. And he said, Ed, you're right, because we so much we focus on the poor and reaching the poor and reaching the needy. And I believe in doing that. I know it's so important, but we also have to understand our demographics and where we are in our culture and all around us, 100 gated communities in our area. And he said, Ed, the people that I interact with, the people that I, he said, they're billionaires, they're millionaires, they have more than they could ever need. And their kids are on drugs. And their kids are in prison. And they're struggling with morals in their life. And they're struggling with alcoholism. But on the surface, they mask stuff with things. And so we look at them and say, well, they've got all they need. There's no way that they're ever going to be reached with the gospel, not knowing that internally they're hurting and they're broken. You guys with me? And what compassion does is compassion looks past the stuff and compassion sees. Compassion sees the hurt. Here's the second thing, compassion feels. 
when he saw the crowds, look at the passage again, look at the verse. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion feels, means this, that when Jesus interacted, when Jesus saw the man with leprosy, that when he came across him, Jesus saw this guy that was outside of the city. He wasn't allowed in the city. He wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. He wasn't allowed to be around anybody. He wasn't allowed to touch anybody. And that when Jesus saw this guy and he interacted with him, it means that Jesus, because compassion feels, Jesus felt the same sorrow. Jesus felt the alienation. Jesus felt the same things that he was going through. When the man's daughter died, Jesus felt the bereavement. He felt the sorrow. When he came across the people that were hurting and lame and sick, it means that Jesus felt the same things that they were going through because compassion feels... Compassion feels. I think one of the the greatest scriptures that that really give us a snapshot of the humanity of Jesus is found in uh, John chapter 11, verse 35, where it simply says this shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus cried. They came to him and they said, Jesus, the, the, the one you love, Lazarus, The one that you love, man, he's your best friend. He's like family to you. He's one of the guys that you hang out with. The one you love is dead. And Jesus felt the brokenness that his sister felt and those that were friends with Lazarus, the same things that they felt. He felt internally, and it says as a result of that, Jesus wept, he cried, he felt the emotion and the sorrow. Compassion feels See, it's hard to help mend the wounds and help heal the wounds that we don't feel. And I'm praying and saying, God, help us to see the wounds. Help us to see our community. Help us to see the people that we interact with on a day-to-day basis. You know, there are people that you come in contact with on a regular basis. You know, I kind of have different places that I go to all the time, whether it's, I used to go to Starbucks all the time every morning and I saw the same people every single day and then I stopped going there because I decided I wanted to save five thousand dollars a year (laughs) you know what I'm talking about and and so you know and now you know our lifestyle as a family it's just like so fast-paced and interactive we're not good grocery shoppers you know we're not really good at grocery shopping for like two weeks in a row you know like going once every two weeks that's not us we're like day to day you know, we're the day-to-day grocery shoppers, you know, it's 5.30, we're on our way home, what do you want to eat? I don't know, I'll stop by the store. I mean, that is every single night, every night. And we know, you know, we've, we've got to recognize the people at the grocery store and know the people at the grocery store, and we know the ones that have ICS and the ones that have IBS and the ones that have all the issues. You know, it's like you, you start to know these people and here's the thing, we interact with people all the time, we interact with neighbors, we interact with coworkers. we interact with family members, and if we could just get past some of the garbage and get past some of the mundane stuff that's going on or some of the barriers, and that's what Jesus was great at, he was great at tearing down the barriers or tearing down the walls that separated people, and if we could just tear down some of those things, we would see that people have wounds in their life and we have the healing balm. Because compassion feels. Compassion sees and compassion feels. And then thirdly, look at this. Compassion does. See, sympathy can feel and sympathy can see and empathy can feel and empathy can see and and, and, and feeling sorry for someone, oh, you can, you can feel it. You can, oh, man, I've just got that gut level feeling. I feel sorry for this person. I, I see what's going on in their life. But this, listen to me, this is where compassion is separated from all those other feelings, if you will, because compassion not only sees and compassion not only feels, but compassion then does something about it. <laughs> compassion puts motion in the emotion, 
It gets active. It gets involved. Look at Jesus. It didn't say, you'll find, you know, probably 20 different references. If you just Google compassion in the New Testament, you'll probably find 20 different references regarding Jesus, where Jesus had compassion, but it never just leaves people there. Jesus never just had compassion and walked away. Look at this, Matthew 14, verse 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and what? And he healed the sick, because compassion does something. In Matthew 20, verse 34, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. See, when the 4,000, Jesus had been teaching for several days and and they were so glued to him. Man, they hadn't even thought about food. Isn't it funny? We kind of get in and we think about food constantly. But these people were listening to the words of Jesus. He was teaching and preaching. They were just in awe by his words and the authority of his words and the compassion that he had. They didn't even think about eating. And finally, Jesus said, these people, they've been here a long time. They're hungry. I have compassion on on them. And he fed the 4,000. Because compassion does something. You know, we've got an opportunity. It's kind of unique that this message falls in the time and the season that we are right now. Because we've got an opportunity right now with uh, Pastor Daniel and Bryce. You know, my son's here for the summer. And, um, you know, we're working on the backpack outreach. Some of you participated in that last year. Last year, we gave out more than 700 backpacks. We have more than 1,000 people that showed up at Riverside Park. We partnered together with another church. This year, we're spearheading the event. We're going to be doing it again, and this year, we're going to have 1,000 backpacks that we're going to be supplying for our church, and we're going to re- be reaching out to the poor and to the needy and those who are struggling. And, and some of you will remember last year that people waited more than two hours, two to three hours in a hot line to get a backpack. Now, we can talk about loving people and we can talk about reaching the community and compassion sees and we see the needs and all that. But see, we can talk about all those things, but ultimately, compassion does something about it. Compassion does. And I'm grateful for the organizations in our community that are doing something about it. I'm grateful for the organizations that we partner with, Benita Assistance. Different organizations, St. Matthew's House down in Naples, organizations that we work with, that we send volunteers to, that are doing something about some of the needy problems. But we've got to be careful. Listen to me. We've got to be careful that we just don't pawn it off or that we throw a couple of bucks at it and think that we've just somehow got off because we are all responsible. Every single one of us are responsible for doing something just mentioning it i was so encouraged by our people last night we had a great service last night we got a great service already today it's gonna be a great weekend i just know that last night more than 20 people signed up to be volunteers at the backpack outreach it's incredible i know a bunch of you are gonna sign up go to the welcome center sign up today let us know that you want to help you know why because compassion does something in colossians 3 verse 12 i'm getting ready to wrap this up but listen to this colossians 3 verse 12 Listen to what Paul said. Paul said this. He said, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love, look at this, clothe yourselves with compassion. Don't you like that? Clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. Oh, look at this. Bear with each other. Have you ever had to bear with people? Bear with each other. Oh, no, I don't like that part. But bear with people. Bear with each other and forgive. Forgive one another. If any of you have a, has a grievance against someone, forgive them. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. I like the way that Paul throws that in, in there. Hey, bear with them because don't forget that the Lord has bared with you. And forgive one another just as Christ, as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Clothe yourself with compassion. Here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing about this. Clothe yourself with compassion. What was unique about this time frame was that the cloak, the outer cloak, was the identifying piece that really helped people to be able to identify one another, you know, even from a distance. You know, if you saw me from a distance today and you saw what I had on, you'd see me in a mall or out somewhere eating or something like that. You see the blackjack, and from the distance, you'd say, oh, there's Pastor Ed. 
I recognize what he's wearing. But for the people back during Paul's time when he was writing this, they, most of them only had one garment. They had just this one outer cloak. And that outer cloak was the thing that identified them and identified who they were to the people around them. And so that one piece was so very important because it almost represented who they were. That one garment. And so don't, don't miss the depth of what's happening here. Don't miss what, what Paul is trying to say. He said this is something that identifies us as a Christ follower. That from a distance people should be able to recognize you. Clothe yourself with this garment of compassion. When people look at you, they identify you as a Christ follower because of the compassion and the kindness that you have. Clothe yourself with compassion. Aurora, come on up if you would. And one of the great stories, Christy, hand me that piece of paper if you would. Many of you have heard of, you know, we all, we all know Michael Jordan. You know, we, we know his story, you know, considered by some to be one of the greatest athletes of all time. Of course, today, some of it's debatable. You know, a lot of things happening and, you know, in the world of basketball and different things like that. But you know, Michael Jordan kind of finished his star-studded career with a stellar performance in a championship game. Time was winding down. The Chicago Bulls were down by a basket. Michael Jordan gets the ball. He makes some kind of crazy move and, you know, around the defender, kind of jukes him to the point that the defender actually falls down. And as the buzzer is about to sound, Jordan throws a ball up in the air, knocks it down for a three-pointer, winning the championship game. For a lot of us, we remember that. Many of you can remember some of those games, and we remember seeing Michael Jordan take off from the free throw line and, you know, dunk the ball. We remember the crazy dunks and a lot of the crazy things that he did and his incredible defense and shooting ability. And we remember the popularity and the commercials and the fame and, and all those things. But I want to share with you a story that maybe some of you haven't heard it's a story that involves a boy by the name, a young boy, eight years old, by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius was a young man who was extremely thin, extremely quiet. His mother and boyfriend had been put in prison for murder. They had tortured Cornelius and his younger four-year-old brother for a number of years one day Cornelius picked up the phone the torture was so bad the abuse was so bad he picked up the phone his brother his four-year-old brother was being abused so bad that secretly he got away was able to call 911 when the police showed up they ended up taking Cornelius out of the home but his young brother Laddie didn't survive the abuse from that earlier that day I, I can't even tell you how horrendous the prosecutor said that it was the worst and the police said it was the worst abuse that they had ever seen in all of their lives. This young boy by the name of Cornelius was taken out, obviously, and testified against his mother and boyfriend. They were put in prison and ended up going to a couple of different foster homes. But this reporter picked up the story and began to tell the story of Cornelius and talked about his love for basketball and reading. And the vice president for the Chicago Bulls at the time read the story and ended up getting in contact with the reporter and, and told the reporter that he, you know, even though every game during that time was sold out, he would make it possible for Cornelius to come to the game and he would make sure that there were tickets available. And so, you know, the vice president sent tickets. And so this reporter who had taken this great interest in Cornelius brought him to the game. And, uh, they, you know, they, they walk in and they're just completely blown away. This young boy, Cornelius, all he knew his whole lifetime was abuse and, and neglect and humiliation. Now here he is walking in, the great love of his life, basketball. He's walking into this incredible stadium, this incredible arena. And, and I'd like to tell the rest of the story from the perspective of the reporter who took him to the game. And he, and he writes this. To every Chicago youngster who follows basketball, the stadium was a shrine. Think of where Cornelius was. Locked up and tormented and hurt. And now here he was in the stadium about to see the Bulls play for the very first time. He walked down a stairway. We walked down a stairway until we were in a lower level hallway. And Cornelia stood between us. 
And then a door opened and a man came out. Cornelius looked up and his eyes filled with a combination of wonder and awe and total disbelief. Cornelius tried to say something. His mouth was moving, but no words came out. He tried to speak, and then the man helped him out by speaking first. Hi, Cornelius, the man said. My name is Michael Jordan. Jordan knelt down and spoke quietly with Cornelius. He made some jokes and told some stories about basketball and took his time and didn't rush. You have to understand that for a long time, the only adults Cornelius had any contact with were adults who wanted to hurt and humiliate him. And now Michael Jordan was saying, are you going to cheer for us today? We're really going to need it. And Jordan went back to the locker room to finish dressing for the game. I walked Cornelius back upstairs to the court and there was one more surprise waiting. Cornelius was given a red shirt of a kind worn by the Bulls ball boys. He retrieved balls for the players from both teams as they warmed up. Then as the game was about to begin, he was led to Jordan's seat on the Bulls bench. That's where he was going to sit, right next to Jordan, right in Jordan's seat. And during the minutes of the game when Jordan was out and resting, Cornelius would be sitting next to him. And then when Jordan was on the court, Cornelius would be saving a seat for him. And at one point late in the game, Jordan took a pass and sailed it into the air and slammed home a basket. And there, just a few feet away, was Cornelius Abraham laughing out loud with joy. And we all applauded the incredible basket. The act of kindness that Jordan showed, Cornelius, was receiving the applause of heaven. Because you see, greatness in the kingdom of heaven is measured by the small acts of kindness. You know, we hear different stories and we make them so grandiose and we hear great stories of compassion and we say to ourselves, well, sure, if I got an opportunity to do something really big, I would do it. But we have opportunities every day to interact with the Corneliuses of the world, not knowing their stories, not knowing the things that are going on, but through small, random, even, acts of kindness, showing compassion, showing love, reaching out to the people around us. And I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that we can see a radical transformation take place all around us, all around us. Bonita for Jesus, Naples for Jesus, Estero for Jesus, Fort Myers Beach for Jesus, our community, the community surrounding us for Jesus. And I believe we could see that happen if we reach out in love, kindness, and compassion with that strong gut feeling that we do something about. Because compassion sees, and compassion feels, and compassion does. Bow your heads, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone in this room. God, I know it's in our heart to be compassionate. I know it's in our heart. God, we want that more than anything else. And Lord, sometimes we miss the opportunities. We miss those moments. And I just pray and ask you to help us. Help us to be able to see things the way that you see them. God, I, I, I just know, Lord, there, there are things that happen all around us, Lord. There are times that we interact with people and times that we see people. And, and help us just to not be abrupt. Help us not to be irritated or any of those things. But God, help us to just stop and take time. Maybe it's with people that we don't even know. Maybe it's people at Target, or, you know, in the checkout line, or the, you know, the, the, the girl or guy that's the cashier at Publix that we see every day or every other day. Maybe it's a young lady that walks into Starbucks at the same time that we, st- we, we, we go every morning and, and, and get coffee. And do- Lord, there are people that are all around us. Help us to be able to see them. Lord, even this week, help us to be able to see with your eyes. Because, Lord, I know that if, if you were here and you were physically walking in Bonita Springs, that you would be guided and you would be looking for those opportunities as people passed by you would look for those opportunities to extend love and compassion and God help us to get rid of our predisposed ideas and the way we think things are help us to remove our blocks and our barricades and the barriers help us to get rid of how we categorize people and segment people out and help us to see and understand that for God so loved the world God, this week, would you give us opportunities? 
Lord, with the backpack outreach, would you do something incredible in it? God, would you bring people and gather them together so that we could impact thousands of people? Maybe it's not going to be with the gospel message, but it might be through love and compassion and uh, Christian songs being played and a helping hand. Lord, you said when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. God, we just thank you. We thank you so much that you're stirring our hearts. If you're here today and you say, Ed, pray with me because my life isn't right with Jesus. Today, I need to give my life to Christ because my life is not right with God. And I know that if I were to stand before God right now and he were to ask me, why should I let you into my heaven? I wouldn't know what to say. But if you're here and you need to get your life right with God today, I want you to pray with me. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, wash me, purify me. From this day forward, I will live for you for the rest of my life. I thank you for saving me and dying on the cross for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer,